Hey everybody, this is Jerry Stoughter, and today we're going to be talking about part four of ship fitting for new bros, fit for function. In today's video, we're going to be covering the fundamentals of ship role and how this should inform your ship fitting theory and the philosophy behind how you approach ships. In order to get started, we really do need to understand in a broader way what role looks like in broader ship categories in New Eden. When you start in the new player experience and you do the initial career agent missions and uh, career content, you're going to be introduced to a variety of different ships. If you do the military missions, you'll get introduced to combat vessels. If you do the industry missions, you'll get introduced into building ships and into flying the venture mining frigate and doing mining. If you do the business missions, you'll get introduced into hauling. Exploration will introduce you to exploration ships. And a little bit of these will also give you some uh, introduction to ratting or fighting pirates, NPC characters in space. But there are four broad categories for the purposes of fitting that we can talk about when it comes to understanding the roles of ships in EVE Online. The first is combat vessels. Here pictured is a Confessor Tier 3 destroyer from the Amar. It is a combat vessel, and combat vessels fall into three subcategories. The first is damage dealers, the second is logistics vessels or logi that are specifically focused on providing repairs. There are the healers of EVE Online. And then there are the E-War vessels, which act in support of combat vessels in fleets. Then in our second category, we have haulers. Pictured here is the bowhead. It is essentially EVE's ship shipping ship. It is a giant ship maintenance bay and hangar uh, with the intent and purpose of transporting fitted ships through space. There are many haulers smaller than it, um, but the purpose of all haulers is essentially to transport goods from one area of space to another. Then you have your mining and harvesting vessels. Pictured here is the Venture Mining Frigate, the ore or outer ring excavations group, design and build all of the harvesting vessels in EVE Online, and they all have one of three focuses. They're bonused either for mining or for gathering ice, or for harvesting gases, or all three. Now, the thing with harvesting goods from space, be they ore, gas, or ice, is that they all take up a lot of space. So the characteristic of these mining and harvesting vessels is that they have specific holds designed to transport those goods. This is a trait which is shared pretty much universally across all of these vessels. And this group also includes not just the direct harvesters themselves, but also harvesting command ships. So industrial command ships like the Porpoise and the Orca and uh, also specialized ships like the Noctis, which is used for salvage. Moving into our last group, we have what can almost be considered the miscellaneous group, but I prefer to identify these by their broader category, which is PVE vessels. Now this group is very, pretty evenly di divided between combat vessels that are heavily advantaged for doing PVE or ratting, and also the other half of that group belonging to those other categories of engagement in PVE, such as exploration, hacking, um, you know, sightseeing, ships like the Zephyr, um, ships that don't fall into one of the previous three categories or, or maybe which overlap with one of the previous three categories, but really excel in their particular role. Now, something you need to keep in mind is that all of these different ship categories are individually um, interchangeable. They are tools to be used. Each one of these ship classes and categories is unique in that um, they have an intended purpose, but when you are not seeking to fulfill that purpose, use a different ship. So if you're gonna be mining, use a mining vessel. If you're gonna go exploring, get a ship that's bonus for exploring. If you're gonna be engaged in combat, talk to the fleet commander or FC who's going to be guiding that fleet and find out what ship they want you to get into. And if you need to move stuff through space, how much stuff do you have to move and how much risk can you accept in your activities? You, if by thinking about these individual ships 
as interchangeable tools like a wrench or a spanner uh, or a clamp, depending on what it is that you want to do, there's going to be a ship that fits that particular role that you're looking to fill. And this is the proper approach to thinking about ships in EVE. If you're a new player, and again, there are, there are exceptions to these four broad categories. I'm not going to cover all the talking points that, you know, more um, senior players are going to sit down and, and tinfoil hat about it all day long. But you will see that in these four main broad categories, the majority of the purposes that you're going to seek a ship for in EVE are satisfied. To begin, let's talk about some broader you know, implications here. So in combat vessels, you'll have support vessels like the burst. If you're flying a bunch of combat ships that rely heavily on shield tank, and particularly if you're in small gang, you'll want Logi frigates around or Logi cruisers. And a good Logi frigate is the burst, which is designed and intended to be used for repairing shield-based uh, ship systems. If you're flying an armor fleet, you'd want to have something like the Inquisitor, which again receives bonuses for repairing armor systems. Now, what if you want to be on the damage dealing side? Well, if you're in an armor fleet, you might want something like the Tormentor. The Tormentor is a fantastic little frigate. All of its bonuses are aimed at helping it to deal extra damage with energy weapons. And if you're looking at something where maybe you want the flexibility of either being able to use shield or armor, uh, you might look at something like an Incursus, which receives very similar bonuses to the Tormentor, but focused on um, blaster weapons and the ability to field drones. Both excellent small gang and solo PvP vessels. They're both very inexpensive. They're both accessible to both Alpha and Omega players, and they're easy to get into. Now, what if you want to get into something like exploration? Well, you might find yourself getting into a Kaldari Heron or a Mar Magnate, as pictured here. Again, these fall into that fourth category of ships where you're not engaging with other players, you're looking to engage with the environment, whether it be ratting, exploration, hacking, scanning down sites, uh, visiting wormholes, or whatever the case may be. Now, these uh, two picture ships here also come in Tech 2 variants, and those will allow you to, the buzzard and the anathema, will allow you to do the same activities just with a little bit more of an edge at a significantly higher cost and skill to get into. The other thing too is that Tech 2 vessels can only be flown and piloted by Omega characters or pe people who are subscribing to the game, whether they're paying a monthly subscription fee through their bank account or credit card, or whether they're plexing their account, you have to be engaged at a certain level in order to fly Tech 2 vessels. Now, when it comes to the rules of thumb of fitting philosophy and fitting design, you have to consider some basic rules to follow for all ships. The first is that if it has bonuses, fit to those bonuses. So if a ship has a armor specific bonus, use armor. If it has a weapon specific bonus designed for energy weapons, fit energy weapons. Rule number two is if it lacks a tank bonus, use whatever tank makes sense for the activity you're pursuing. Um, in the case of vessels which don't explicitly identify a tank bonus, you could go a couple of different ways. You could feel, fit a shield extender, you could fit a uh, damage control and energized adaptive nanomembranes or you know other modules of that like, but it's going to depend on what your activity is and what it is that you plan to face off against. Number three, you really shouldn't fit against bonuses unless doing so is mega advantageous. And I'll use the example of the Prophecy, which I'll cover a little bit later in this video. The Prophecy is a ship that has a lot of lows, a decent number of mids, and four high slots able to launch uh, either missile launchers or to fit turrets. And the thing with the Prophecy is that the way that it is often fit is that you'll find that it's providing a role of fleet support or it's relying very heavily upon its massive drone bay and its uh, drone bay being able to field three large drones or a full flight of mediums and just having a cavernous drone bay to send drones out for the primary damage dealing. But by the time you finish fitting a tank to it, you get your drone mods on there, you get your command bursts on there, you end up fitting often in a place where you're constrained for power grid 
and for CPU. Now, if you have modules that you can fit in your high slots that allow you to deal damage at range that are not very capacitor or power grid intensive, such as projectile weapons, then that might be something where even though the ship doesn't have any explicit ben um, bonuses or benefits towards that weapon type, it makes sense to fit them there. In PvP, a propulsion module is almost mandatory. It seems wrong almost to put this in the number four slot, um, but I assure you it belongs in this top five very squarely. Um, everything that happens in EVE Online happens in service to PvP. And the reason a propulsion module is almost mandatory is that if you're on grid and you're not able to be mobile, or if somebody's able to web and hold you down and you can't get off grid or you can't maintain enough speed to mitigate incoming damage or to catch your targets, you're gonna be a sitting duck. And it's not a great feeling to sit on grid and just be pounded on by people. Number five, is that warp core stabilizers do terrible, terrible things to PvP effectiveness. And every new player has at some point learned what a warp core stabilizer is in that it gives you bonuses to resistance um, to being scrammed or warp disrupted. It can allow you to get away in a situation where you, know, you would otherwise uh, get held down in a fight. The problem with them is that they were designed to be used on haulers and transport vessels. Ships that are not attempting to lock targets. Ships that are not attempting to block onto other things. And um, when you put a warp core stabilizer on a PVP or combat vessel, or even a PVE vessel, like something you're planning to take out and, and attack rats with, is that warp core stabilizers double your locking time and they have your locking distance. So if you had a ship that was previously able to lock a frigate in two seconds and lock out to a distance of 70 kilometers, it now takes you four seconds and you can only target targets that are 35 kilometers away. It just destroys your capability to be effective. And a lot of new players don't realize this because they aren't looking at the fine print or they don't understand what all the numbers mean. Let me be the first to warn you. Never fit warp core stabilizers to PvP or PvE vessels because it's going to ruin your experience and it's going to make you basically useless on field. Now let's look at a, at a specific example where we apply these rules of thumb. The Merlin from the Kaldari is a blaster frigate. It has three high slots which are only able to fit turrets. It will not fit launchers. It has four medium slots and three load slots. Just looking at this vessel, even before I look at its bonuses, I can tell you that you should be fitting three blasters. You should have a propulsion module, some sort of E-War for holding down targets, be it a web or a scram, or a web and scram. Um, you're going to want to have a adaptive shield hardener and a shield extender. Um, if you only have the option to fit one of those two because you're going scram web or instead of using a warp disruptor, then what you would want to do is have either the shield extender or the hardener, depending on whether or not you have support. And then in your low slots, you'll have a damage control and a couple of um, weapon upgrades to increase your damage efficiency, whether you're increasing your tracking speed so that you can land shots or whether you're increasing the damage output of those weapons. That's the typical fit for a ship like this without even looking at the bonuses that sh this ship gets because that's how those slots will get used up by modules. Now, if we actually look at the bonuses, Based on your training in the Kaldari Frigate skill, you'll get 5% per level bonus to small hybrid turrets. So there's that implicit damage bonus right out the door. Then you get a 4% per level bonus to shield resists. This means that this ship gets an, an immediate bonus to everything you do to try to increase its resistances. So a damage control and a adaptive shield hardener on this, or multi-spectrum shield hardener as they're called now, on this vessel will actually benefit hugely. The, the Having the ability to use a shield extender is just adding extra buffer to your tank. So you could go with blasters on this, use a afterburner or a micro warp drive, go scram web 
with a multi-spectrum hardener and you'd be just fine. Now this is a pretty fat ship. And when I say pretty fat, I mean it's got a lot of mass. It is not a very fast ship when it comes to comparing it with other frigates. It's on par basically with the Punisher from the Amar. It has a base speed of 310 meters per second, which is really not very fast. There's a lot of frigates that go up to almost 500 without putting on a prop mod. And it's got a five second align time. This is really not a fast ship. Yes, you could fit an armor fit using the low slots on this ship. However, you'd be adding mass that would slow the ship down even more. And you'd be taking away those slots, um, those low slots that are used for damage uh, modification, whether it be tracking or uh, damage projection, that would basically neuter your ability to be effective in PvP. So, you know, it, while it has comparable hit points, you know, you're, you're looking at 500 hit point shield capacity versus 350 hit points um, for armor, you'd be fitting against the shield resist bonus that the ship gets if you went with armor. It just doesn't make sense to do that. You'd basically be shooting yourself in the foot. As a good example, the Merlin is a great place to start if you want to try fitting, if especially if you want to start trying to fit for PvP. And if you are a Kaldari Empire pilot or your character started as Kaldari, you can pretty much fly this ship right now. You just need to train up your basic fitting skills. I recommend checking out the EVE University wiki for a list called the Magic 14. I'll link it in the description um, for this video. And I have a video that I've recorded in my video list called uh, Core Skills. You should watch that video immediately after this. Now, when it comes to fitting to specific roles, in this way, we're going to start by looking at PVE and specifically ratting. You want to follow some other basic guidelines. The first of these is that you want to fit your tank to the enemy type you'll be fighting and their damage type. Another chart that I'll link in the description for this video is a, dis is a listing of all the different types of damage that different rats in the game do. And uh, depending on the rat that you're fighting, like if you're fighting the Blood Raiders, they will do primarily EM damage. They will also be weak to the same. Uh, the Serpentis, the you know Sancha, they'll all deal different types of damage, and they are typically weak to the same damage that they primarily deal. If you know the enemy you'll be fighting in the region of space that you're operating in, when you're doing PvE, you want to increase your resistances to that specific type of damage as high as possible to mitigate the incoming damage that you will expect to receive while you're ratting. And the reason for that is because you're going to be fighting wave after wave of their ships in PVE sites. The other thing that comes in here in, in rule number two is that drones and weapons let you control range. And these are very favorable in PVE because by being able to keep a certain distance away from your target, if you're able to project damage at a greater distance than your target is, you can basically hit them from a distance and stay out of range of their weapons or, or reduce the amount of damage that you'll take in coming because their weapons are going into fall off, um, meaning that you're outside their optimal range and damage falls off the farther away you get. Um, you can use speed and distance to mitigate incoming damage while dumping a lot of damage on your target. This is where we lead into rule number three, which is that damage mitigation is as important as damage dealing in PVE. And again, this goes back to the fact that in PVE sites, you're not just fighting one ship one-on-one -on -one and then going on to the next fight. In PVE sites, especially when you go into low and null sec, they spawn you like anywhere between five and 12 ships per wave with multiple waves per site. Um, and when you get into uh, abyssal sites and when you're doing abyssal dead space, um, doing any kind of PV in abyssal dead space, you'll be encountering many different types of enemies in those uh, abyssal subspace rooms uh, where you'll be taking all kinds of different damage and understanding what you're likely to encounter is key to be able to survive long enough to get out of those sites. Number four is you can rat in 75% of the ships in the game, but some are better suited to it than others. And again, this is where damage projection, damage mitigation, and speed come in together. Not necessarily even speed of the ship itself, 
um, a lot of null sec ratters, rat and rattlesnakes or scorpion navies where you can just launch cruise missiles from 100 kilometers away and you're basically sitting still with some sentry drones picking off anything that starts to get close to you. That's an effective way to rat if you can't afford to get into a carrier or if you're not skilled to that level yet um, or if you're not an Omega subscriber. There are ways to rat that don't require your ship to move at all. And in a lot of other doctrines, like if you're using VEX or Navy issues, you want to be orbiting. You might be orbiting at a distance of 50 kilometers, but you'll be moving. And being moving at speed is another strategy for mitigating that incoming damage while you use either drones or missiles or whatever the case may be to eliminate the enemy ships. The reason speed is important is that speed equals profit. You get paid out from your bounties every 20 minutes. This is colloquially referred to as a tick. Every 20 minutes, any of the bounties that you've earned in that previous 20 minutes gets paid out. The more rats that you can kill and the more sites you can clear in a 20 minute period, the higher your bounty payouts will be. Now, for the sake of looking at high sex sites, because this is a video aimed at new players, I'm gonna talk about the Crucifier and the Tristan. Now the Crucifier gets a 7.5% per level bonus to weapon disruptors and a 10% per level bonus to disruptor range. E-War, uh, whether it be Galente E-War where you're uh, signal disruption or whether it's uh, Kaldari E-War where you're using ECM to break the you know lock of the enemy or if it's Minmatar E-War where you're using target painting to make the targets easier to hit or to take more damage or Amar Ewar, as in this case, where you're disrupting their targeting systems. Um, you have the ability to use these systems against NPCs, although they may be less effective. Um, this particular ship benefits hugely by being able to disrupt turret tracking so that it can use its speed, because it is a very fast and nimble frigate. It can use its speed and, and weapon disruption to prevent incoming damage by basically playing a giant game of keep away. The Tristan, however, also uses speed, but its, um, its response is rather than trying to play a game of keep away, it uses drones and rail guns uh, when doing PVE to apply damage at speed while trying to outrun incoming damage. It gets a 7.5% percent per level bonus to small hybrid tracking speed which means that even if it's going very quickly and it's kiting at distance it's still able to use its uh, rail guns to drop rounds on the target even when it's moving very quickly and it gets a 10 percent per level bonus to drone hit points and tracking speed so the drones will fly and be able to track faster and will have more hit points so how you'll typically fit both of these vessels up is that you'll have a micro warp drive on it. They'll be orbiting at distance. Um, the Tristan will be firing and using drones, while, whereas the Crucifier will be using its weapon disruptors to prevent incoming damage from the tougher enemies while the drones do the job of dealing damage. The Tristan can hold eight drones and field five. The Crucifier can hold nine. These are both excellent excellent vessels for doing um, level one two and three anomalies in high sec and you'll find that um, they're extremely survivable and as you get used to fitting them and using them in high sec space you'll find that you will eventually graduate into using destroyers for the more difficult sites and simply because of higher damage output the more comfortable you become with ships the better you'll adapt to being able to use them for PvE. This is by no means an exhaustive list of the good ships to use. In high sec, I'm just using this as two examples. Let's talk about solo PvP. When it comes to solo PvP, probably the par excellence vessel for solo PvP is the Garmer. It's also one of the most feared. It is fast, it is nimble, it can warp disrupt from like 50 kilometers away, it gets huge bonuses to warp disruption and scramming. And um, <laughs> just like the picture of this vessel, a lot of them are covered in kill marks because they're really good at what they do. Uh, when it comes to picking your fights, holding a target down and hitting them from distance with missiles, there really isn't too many ships that sit on the same level as the Garmer. 
But if you're a new player in this game, trying to find, you know, the, the money to pay for 120 million esque for a frigate, it's uh it's probably not in most new players' ballparks. This is definitely a ship that is used um, by more established players who have the wallet to pay for replacing it if it gets destroyed. Now, when it comes to looking at solo PvP guidelines, there is another vessel that I can recommend, and it's just as an example. But let's look at the guidelines for solo PvP. The first is that solo, solo PvP is a challenge of extremes. The first is that you need to deal enough damage to kill your enemies quickly, but have just enough tank to survive the other guy's incoming damage. You want to be able to hit first, hit hard, knock the other guy out fast, and hopefully get away with enough of your teeth still intact that you, you know, look like you won the fight. Number two is that you have to have some way to keep the other guy pinned down in the fight, because it's no good if he just runs off. If you go to engage and you, you decide to start fighting one another, whether it's, you know, a mutual engagement or unconsensual, you'll go in for the fight, you'll start dealing damage. But if that guy can just warp off, well, that's the end of the fight, unless you can catch him again. So some sort of e-war to hold them down, be it a web, scram, warp disruptor, you need some way to hold them. The third is that electronic warfare beyond just warp disruption can grant a huge winning edge in solo combat. It used to be that having ECM on your side would make fights incredibly unfair. They've recently balanced ECM, so that's not as much the case anymore. Definitely hugely helpful in small gang, but there are other ways that electronic warfare can win you out in a fight. Uh, in particular, capacitor warfare, which comes from the Amar. Number four, fighting outnumbered is a losing proposition most of the time. If you're fighting one on three or one on four, in most cases, unless you're very good and you know exactly what you're doing, you're probably going to die and very quickly. So that's what leads us to rule number five, which is to pick your battles and expect to die. If you're going out to do solo PvP, I strongly recommend that either you befriend an industrialist who can build you ship hulls for cheap, or you buy a lot of them and you find a way to, to build up your income, which I'll talk about in a future video on money ways, uh, or ways of making money in EVE Online. Um, but you're going to want to build up a supply of fit ships that you can just take out and lose until you lost enough ships and learned enough of the hard combat lessons that you stop losing them and you start winning fights. Um, it is an, an inevitability in EVE Online that you will lose ships. If you're going to engage in PvP, you will lose them faster. And that's just part of PvP. Um, in a lot of games, and I'll pick on a game I've been playing a lot of lately, like Apex Legends, um, there's no implicit loss you know, you go out with your fire squad, you drop in, you get some kills, you get killed, end of match, you go back to the lobby, you jump back into the next match. There's there's nothing lost there. In EVE Online, every time you lose a ship, you have to go get another one. And rule number, v, rule number one of EVE is you will lose ships. Rule number two of EVE, although a lot of people will cite this as being the first, is don't undock anything you can't afford to lose. The whole focus of solo PvP is that you're going out there to wreck somebody else's day. They might be anticipating that you're coming or they may be ready for you. So be prepared to lose your own ship. Having 40 or 50 Tristans pre-fit, pre ready to go, sitting in a hangar with a fit that you have vetted by senior players that can say, yeah, that'll probably survive a fight makes it a lot easier to take those out and get into fights because if you lose one, you just go back and undock another. You know, no big deal. Already replaced. But the better you get, the less likely you will be to lose a ship if you engage in a fight that you think you can win. Now let's look at an advanced vessel for solo PvP. The Kaldari Navy Hookbill is a great example of a ship that gets used to great effect by solo PvPers, especially in low sec. It gets a 10% per level bonus to missile and rocket maximum velocity, and it gets a 25% per level bonus to kinetic missile and rocket damage. Now if we just stopped there, this would be on par with a lot of Kaldari vessels. Basic kinetic bonus, 
gets missile bonuses either to velocity or tracking or whatever the case may be. But it gets missile bonuses and it gets a kinetic bonus. This, you know, by itself would make it a pretty standard Kaldari vessel. But it also gets a 20% per level bonus to other missile and rocket damage, which means that with five levels of Kaldari frigate, you're dealing 100% more damage with missiles that do EM, thermal, and explosive damage than you would do in any other Kaldari vessel. And if you're using kinetic missiles, you're doing, or kinetic rockets, you'll be doing 125% of the normal amount of damage. That's pretty incredible by itself, but this ship has a huge array of slots. How it's typically fit is three Tech 2 rocket launchers, a damage control and a small plate, and then in the mid slots, you'll have an afterburner, a scram, two webs, and a tracking disruptor. And the reason for the tracking disruptor is you want to get in fast enough that you can get in under their guns. You're using the tracking disruptor to prevent them from shooting back at you. And you're using the dual webs to hold them down to the point where basically they can't move at all. And all of your damage is applying. Now, this fit, you may find yourself needing a overclocking module or other fitting room rigs in order to be able to fit this as described and you'll have to have fairly good fitting skills meaning your cpu management and power grid management trained to five and your skills trained up to mitigate the amount of cpu and power grid usage um, being used by those modules but once your fitting skills are solid and you have the right rigs a ship like this can absolutely wreck people's days in low sec now, what happens when you're fitting to roll for fleet PvP if you're going out with others? Well, rule number one is fleets are necessarily composed of multiple ships. You need a critical mass of vessels in order to be able to take out enemy ships. You want to overwhelm them with numbers so that the amount of damage any individual ship does is inconsequential except for its ability to multiply by numbers. So if a ship needs to survive say 300,000 EHP, you know, a pretty big hauler. The easiest way to kill that hauler is either to be able to hold it down and shoot it for a long period of time, whittling down its health, or to attack it with enough ships at one time that all of those ships firing together overwhelms its EHP in two or three volleys or even in a single volley. Fleets usually operate with a logistics wing, meaning that the ships that you're taking out do not self-repair. When you're in a fleet, the majority of you will be damage dealers, maybe a third of you or a quarter of you will be in Logi ships providing reps for everybody else, and you'll have some E-War. And fleets rely on numbers for damage output and survivability. And survivability, when it comes to fleet numbers, is that if there are enough of you, the enemy has to eliminate substantial numbers before your total damage output, be it volley or total DPS, falls below a point where you stop being effective. So you don't wanna just hit that critical mass of numbers to deal damage and delete people off field. You wanna have more than enough damage to do that so that when you start losing ships, you don't immediately become defanged and unable to continue fighting. That's why fleet numbers are so important, is that not only do you need that critical mass for damage dealing, you need to have enough people so that when you start getting picked off, the fight isn't immediately over. Fleets also almost invariably depend on command bursts from support vessels. Command bursts increase the operating thresholds of those vessels, either increasing their mobility, their locking speed or range, um, increase the amount of armor hit points or shield resistances they have. They improve the ship's uh, ability to respond to threats from an enemy fleet and to uh, react in a way that cohesively makes the entire fleet better at what they're doing. And number five, fleets take advantage of range management. Range management and dictating range is really, really important in fleets because being able to keep the enemy inside your optimal or fall off damage range while staying outside of their damage or staying ahead of their primary damage dealers 
is really, really important. And also being able to keep at a certain distance from enemy Lodgy so that you can eliminate their ability to heal themselves is a strategic focus of understanding fleet combat and becoming a skirmish commander or a fleet commander. You need to be aware of where are people in space? Where's your fleet? Where's the enemy fleet? Where are they moving? How are they behaving? Are they coming towards you or flying away? Are they keeping it at distance or are they diving in? And understanding how that enemy FC is themselves compensating for your actions and your fleet's behavior is a big part of the mental load that a FC goes through in training to understand fleet combat, which is why typically when you're joining fleet PVP, you're leaving those decisions and that process up to the fleet commander. In fleet combat, you anchor or you approach or follow the fleet commander or whoever the, the combat anchor is, and you deal damage when they tell you to deal damage and you shoot at who they tell you to shoot at because that's the only way to be effective. Now, I mentioned that I would talk about the prophecy. Here's a good example of how a prophecy, um, you know, plays itself out in fleet combat. It gets a 10% per level bonus to drone hit points and damage. So it is going to rely on drones for a significant portion of its ability to deal damage. It gets a 12% per level, or sorry, a 12% bonus to drone micro warp drive speed, which means that the drones fly around on grid a whole lot faster, and they're able to engage with targets more quickly. It also has a 75 megabit per second bandwidth, which means that it can field three large drones at any given time, or five medium drones in a single flight, and it has a cavernous drone bay. It also gets a 4% per level bonus to armor resistances. And because this ship has, I believe, six or seven low slots, um, it has the ability to fit just an absolutely gargantuan tank. Uh, for a ship of its size, it can get almost 100,000, 120,000 EHP properly fit with good skills. Um, it can also fit one command burst and it gets a base bonus of up to 50% to bonus or to burst range. I think it's base 50% burst range. Now, there are rigs that you can fit that allow you to add additional command bursts, and a typical fitting for a prophecy is that it will run with two command bursts, um, and sometimes with three heavy missile launchers, but it'll depend on, on the doctrine and what it is that you're doing. But the prophecy is an excellent um, fleet PvP vessel. Uh, sometimes gets called the battle chicken, and uh, kind of because it looks like a bird. But uh, I quite like the Prophecy. It's one of my more favorite vessels to get out in. And believe it or not, you can solo PvP in this vessel. Now, when it comes to fitting for roll and hauling, it's important to understand that haulers are not PvP vessels. They're not designed to fight. They're designed to be filled up with lots of expensive things and transported around space. And yes, that does tend to make you a little bit of a target. But these are not offensively fit vessels. They are transports. Just in the same way that you don't see people riding all Mad Max down the highway and semi-trailer trucks loaded up with machine guns, um, the, the space highways of New Eden are no different. When it comes to fitting for hauling, industrials favor low slots first. You'll be lucky if you have an industrial that has more than four mid slots, but almost every um, industrial vessel, every hauling vessel in EVE Online will have at least five low slots. And the reason for that is because those slots are there so that you can do a few different things. The first is that you can fit defensively, and defensive fittings tend to be the norm for uh, industrial vessels. You can fit reinforced bulkheads to increase the hull strength of the ship, but that tends to reduce your cargo capacity and ship agility. It makes you less quick to get off of grid, and it reduces how much stuff you can take with you. Expanded cargo holds increase your cargo capacity, but they reduce your hull strength. You can kind of think about this as being like uh, taking an old Nissan and adding a roll cage is like adding reinforced bulkheads, but stripping everything out of the car to make it lighter so that it goes faster or so that you can fit more in it reduces how you know rigid the cage will be of the vehicle if it rolls over. Armor plates increase your hit points, but they add mass and slow you down. And taking the example of a Nissan, putting two inch thick armor plates on the outside of a Nissan when it's only got a four cylinder engine 
well, you can imagine how slow it's going to go. Yeah, you might be able to survive somebody shooting you with an AK, but you're not going anywhere very fast. Because industrial ships are pretty slow to begin with, people tend to rely upon something called the micro-warp drive trick. Now, people will refer to the micro-warp drive trick as being one of two things. The first is using a micro-warp drive and a cloak to get off of grid really quickly. Uh, I believe CCP now considers that an exploit and it's been blocked. Uh, what I'm referring to when I talk about the micro-warp drive trick, trick is the trick that gets used by industrials and by capital vessels by having a micro-warp drive fit when you come through a gate or when you land after jumping, if you, you know, have f come out of your cloak cycle on a gate, when you align to where you want to warp to, or you pick a pick your outbound gate and click warp, if you cycle your micro warp drive on and off really quickly, like you turn it on and then you immediately turn it off again, if your micro warp drive cycle takes six to eight seconds to finish, you will get up to warp speed in that six to eight seconds nearly every time. If you don't have a micro warp drive or an afterburner fit, and you try to go into warp not aligned to the gate that you need to get to in an industrial ship, your typical speed to get into warp will be anywhere between eight and 16 seconds. So using a micro warp drive to get off grid faster is very good because the longer you spend sitting on grid, especially on a gate, the more likely you are to be targeted by gankers. You want to be in constant motion when you're in industrial. And again, if it takes 10 to 12 seconds for you to get to warp, but an MWD cycle will do it in half the time, be mobile. Now, I'm going to talk about new additions here. And Upple Consortium ships are the newest additions to the game. They are Edencom's response to the Triglavians. And I think to some degree, these came in with a design philosophy that was uh, intended at some level to be used for PvP. But unfortunately, the damage they deal is anemic. However, the unique trait of their weapons, the Arcing Vorton Projector, is that it deals a pretty high level of damage for per shot, but it deals it across multiple ships. So you'll you'll target one ship, the shot will hit that hit that enemy ship, and it will immediately ricochet to any ships that are within a certain distance. Uh, hence the name Arcing. So it arcs from one target to another. Um, because it is relatively low damage for the ships of various sizes, be they frigate, cruiser, or battleship, um, you end up in a situation where in PvP, if you've only got a couple of these, um, it's an anemic response. You're, you're not going to be able to deal enough damage to take out your enemies. So for PvP, I think that these ships are terrible. However, for PvE, for ratting, these ships are fantastic. And they come in three flavors. The Skybreaker the Stormbringer, and the Thunderchild. And the Arcing Vorton Projector, I've, I've done this on stream a few times on Twitch. Um, I've taken these ships out to go ratting with them. They're excellent for PV. You clear sights in high sec and low sec at two or three times the speed of nearly any other ratting ship. The big disadvantage is, is that these ships are easily six or seven times more expensive than your most expensive ratting vessels. Um, if you're going to be taking out, you know, a Vex or Navy issue, you can get a fully fit Vex or Navy issue, even like really blingy fit Vex or Navy issue for under 200 million. The Thunderchild's hold, like just the hull of this ship is 200 million-esque um, and varies in price uh, uh, upwards from there. You know, these are, these are far too expensive to be justifiable as PVE vessels for now, but I hope that eventually... One of the things CCP will do is to make these an NPC seated blueprint and make them uh, much more easy to build, more in line with Empire vessels. Because again, these are ships that are coming out of Capsuleer and Empire led development. Doesn't make sense for these not to be available in market in that way. Um, they do make for a very pretty engagement when using them in space. The effect is very, very cool. 
Uh, I think there's a lot of great lore around the development of these ships, but I'm apprehensive about their future in PvP. Now, I'm going to take a second to talk about where we're going from here with my videos. When it comes to upcoming videos and what you can expect to see, well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to finish out this ship fitting review for New Bros with Part 5 Advanced Concepts. I'm going to cover the finish of the EVE review of Rubicon to 2019, and uh, I'll be starting on a new series for 2020 and where I think things are going in the game. I have two new clickbaity sounding videos, and I will fully admit that they sound like clickbait, but they're, that's not their whole intent. It really is to, to serve uh, exciting new bro content to the new players in the community. The first is 10 mistakes every new player will make in EVE Online. And these are the same mistakes that I have seen time and time again from new players coming into the game, asking me for advice and support over the last six years. I'll be putting together a very short list and that video will actually follow this video immediately. After that will be eight best ways to make ISK in EVE Online. And this is where I'm gonna cover some of the better advice that I've seen given to new players on how to make ISK and how to develop, more importantly, multiple streams of income so that you can be making money from different sources and be efficient and, and self-sustaining as much as possible, even though CCP has as their stated uh, direction and interest to reduce the state of autarky as much as possible. And if you don't know what our autarky is, is it is the state of self-sufficiency. CCP thinks self-sufficiency is bad for the game, but unfortunately, if people can't you know, afford to continue to play the game, if they can't build ships, if they're not self-sufficient enough to at least afford to be able to continue doing what they've been doing, this game is going to suffer. So I'm going to help you guys out by teaching you some of the better ways to make Isk and Eve from a high level. I'm also going to introduce a lore video talking about the Drifters and the Triglavians and covering some of the history on those two groups. And we'll be doing some looks into cruising the abyss and getting into running abyssal sites. And I'll have some uh, guest lecturers with me for that one. And of course, last but not least, I will be creating new video content for Eve Echoes. Um, so if you're somebody who started playing Eve Online on your mobile device, yes, I'll be making video content explicitly for you guys. Thanks everybody, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I look forward to hearing your guys' feedback. If you have any questions, comments, or anything you wanna know, go ahead and paste those in the comment section below. Feel free to share this video with your friends and if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you wanna see more of my content as it comes out, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell. Thanks guys and talk to you next time.